Mr. Unpopular, Xerxes the First, is number 10. Xerxes is one of two pharaohs on the list who wasn't actually Egyptian, and it ultimately puts Homi in some hot water. He ruled during the 27th dynasty whilst Egypt was a part of the Persian Empire, having the throne from 486 to 465 BC. These Persian kings were acknowledged as a pharaoh despite not being Egyptian, so Xerxes the Great, as he was known, earns a place on our list by virtue of fame. He was wasn't so great to the Egyptians though. He had a disregard for their traditions and religious beliefs and allocated funds away from their temple. He also banged his niece and gave her the robe that his wife had made for him so his wife had her sister-in-law mutilated as revenge. It was this whole big scandal. But it caused Xerxes brother to try and usurp him, something that Xerxes was already dealing with constantly as back at home in Babylonia as well as in Egypt people were trying to steal the throne away from him, causing him to ping pong back and forth between the two places. When he wasn't doing that, Xerxes was failing disastrously at trying to invade Greece. Eventually the embarrassment of his consistent failure to do so and the endless coup attempts on him was a bit too much and Xerxes abandoned the Egyptian throne. His failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians and by extension the film 300 hasn't been very kind. Number 9 is a famous hussy, Ramses the Second. This man could not keep it in his pants. Sure 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 sure, he was the greatest leader of the 19th dynasty and an amazing tactical mind. And made Egypt prosperous, blah blah. He's the son of Seti the first, and Ramesses went on to declare himself a god and the ruler of Egypt for 67 years before dying of natural causes at 90, which is an insane number for an era where the life expectancy was 30. But homeboy was not a modest pharaoh by any means. He was a lying two-faced politician who based his entire campaign on a laundry list of fabrications. The extensive architectural legacy of his reign are thought to have left the throne close to bankruptcy at the time of his death. Before getting to that ripe old age, as mentioned, Ramesses spent any free time he had banging. Enough to sire between 100 to 200 children in his lifetime. He even outlived 12 of his sons. Ramses was one of the first rulers to take on the title of the great before it was cool. All in all, he was pompous and spoiled. He left behind more statues of himself than any other person in the history of the world. He was obsessed with outshining all those who came before him and he would tower over all those that would follow. Speaking of testament to ego, number 8 is Khufu, the son of Seneferu, which I'm probably butchering, who is the first pharaoh to build pyramids. Khufu was on a one-upping mission since day one. He commissioned the Pyramids of Giza, one of the last standing seven wonders of the ancient world, which by the way we learned not too long ago is lopsided. The pyramid was originally covered in white limestone adorned with gold and since stripped away by greedy tourists over the last 4,000 plus years. He used his platform to show also establish mining and trade from what's now modern day Lebanon. Unfortunately, while he brought greatness to Egypt in ways of infrastructure and economy, socially he inspired a lot of mixed reviews due to his use of forced labor and a dismissive nature. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus was a particular critic, depicting Khufu as a vicious tyrant who used slaves to build his great pyramid. Now, many Egyptologists believe that these claims are merely defamatory, guided by the Greek viewpoint that such structures could only be built through greed and misery. If those rumors are true, then Khufu had high expectations and forced labor and no one liked him. If they're not, then he wasn't a bad guy at all. Number 7 is Cambyses, the animal hater. This this is the other Persian pharaoh on our countdown, and he too enjoyed picking on the Egyptians he ruled, but in a very indirect way. See, Cambyses enjoyed watching animals suffer. It said in his spare time he put on fights between lion cubs and puppies and made his wife watch as they t tore each other apart. In fact, nearly every story coming out of Egypt at the time of his rule told about Cambyses involved him ruining the life of one animal or another. Early on, he went to see Apis, the bull that Egyptians treated as a god. Right in front of the priests dedicated to Apis, he pulled out a dagger and just start stabbing the bull until it died, laughing at them and saying, this is a god worthy of the Egyptians. What a prick. Number 6 is Menkuar, the pharaoh who refused death. Even though the title of pharaoh calls them undying and the pyramids are built to take them to the afterlife, you can't blame a person for still being fearful of what happens after they close their eyes for the last time. 25th century BC pharaoh Menkuar is the poster boy for that fear. An oracle once came to him and reportedly told him he only had 6 years left to live. Menkuar was terrified and decided to do everything he could to avoid it, even fool the gods. His biggest plan revolved around the idea Idea that as long as night never came, a new day could never start. If a new day doesn't begin, time couldn't pass, so he couldn't die, right? 
Right. Anyways, on this basis, for the rest of his life, he lit up all the lamps he could and convinced himself it was always daytime. He would not sleep and force countless serfs to suffer with him this way. Every night, he stayed up drinking and celebrating the success until the day he died, because the gods will always have the last laugh. Sorostis, the genital king, is number five. Why genital king? Well, aside from being one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, he commemorated his success in a unique way, by setting up a big pillar with a picture of someone's genitals on it. Male or female, he wasn't picky. He sent warships and troops to every corner of the known world and stretched his kingdom further than anyone else ever had, leaving these pillars on sites of every battleground. Aside from genitalia, the pillars were of course ingrained with how he had subdued his enemies and how certain he was that the gods were in favor of his invade everyone policy. Quite cocky of him. The genitals depicted were based off of how valiantly their opponents had fought their invasion. Male depiction indicated that they were strong and brave soldiers, but the female depiction, well, it meant the word that we are all thinking. These pillars lore left all across the continent and they stood the test of time. 1500 years later, after being erected, they still stand in Syria, engraved with the genitals of failure. Look up the word spoil and you'll see number four is Pepe II. He was the longest ruling Egyptian monarch, surviving 94 years on the throne. The first half of this rule, he brought prosperity and grandeur to Egypt. Second half, nowhere close. In fact, it's the mark of the sharp decline of the old kingdom of Egypt, as economic disarray was due to him virtually having no oversight. Pepe was made pharaoh in his early teen years, so naturally he got the spoiled brat treatment from mommy. A great example is shortly after being crowned, an explorer sent to trade and collect ivory, ebony, and other precious items had written him a letter reporting that he had met a dancing pygmy. Why? This is the greatest thing Pepe had ever heard. He had to see it for himself. So he demanded its transport back immediately and to abandon all precious materials they'd gathered in return for a high reward. Well, he got his dancing pygmy and he got pretty much everything he's ever asked for. He learned to accept that he was more important than other people. By the time he'd grown up, he was so corrupt that he made his serfs strip naked, cover themselves in honey, and follow him around just to keep the flies away. Number three is the klepto gaslighting Amasis. He's remembered as a total prick. Amasis actually made his way onto the throne after the current pharaoh had sent him to calm down a rebellion, but when he got there he realized the rebels had a pretty good chance of winning, so he decided to lead them instead. Amasis decided the best way to tell the king about his change of sides and a declaration of war was by lifting his leg, farting, and telling the messenger to take that back to the king. He was a rampant alcoholic as well as a kleptomaniac. Apparently he would steal his friends' stuff, put it in his own temples, and then try to convince them that they had never owned it in the first place. However, amongst all his bratty behavior, Amasis brought some major reform to oracles. One example actually comes from when he was a poor thief on the street. When he had been caught stealing, he'd been sent to stand in front of oracles who were supposedly be able to divine tell whether he was innocent or guilty. Well, once he was king, he remembered which oracles had pronounced him innocent of the crimes he had committed and had them punished for fraud. Because if they'd actually been able to speak to the gods, they would have known he was always guilty. Number two is cutting down on crime, Actus Sains. Amasis wasn't tolerated for long and he was overthrown the way he'd done to his predecessor. This time the rebellion was led by the Ethiopian Actesanes, who believed in a gentler approach to kinghood. Actesanes fought for the crown literally because of a magic spell he'd heard about and also to deal with Egypt's criminals in a flashy new way, controlled exile. Every person who committed a crime he ruled would have their nose cut off and then they'd be sent off to the town he called Rhinoclora, literally the town of cut off noses. It was exclusively populated by these now noseless criminals struggling to survive in the harsh landscape, drinking dirty water and eating trash or the odd stray quail that came through. Something like this may have seemed harsh, but it was actually considered benevolence at the time. Roman chronologers of Rinacola, or Rincolora, whichever it's pronounced, wrote an example of how Actesanes was actually considering a kindly manner towards his subjects. So keep that in mind when you're doing a comparison of now versus then. And in at number one is Akhenaten. This pharaoh was so hated that the Egyptians themselves wiped his name out of history. Born Amenhotep, he changed his name to a Ahak, I'm gonna call him Ak, in accordance with this radical monotheistic drive. His new name meant that he is of service to the Aten, in honor of what he believed to be the one true god, Aten, the sun god. Ak did everything in the name of the sun god. He moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Amarnia, and then renamed it in Egyptian to mean Horizon of Aten, and then he ordered a new capital city be built there. He chose the site because it was uninhabited. It was not the property of anyone else except Aten. He moved an estimated 20,000 people into this developing city and forced them to build it. These people had to push through 
everything. Based on the bones found in the town cemetery, more than two thirds of his workers broke a bone while they're working, and a good one third of them broke their spines. Almost everyone was malnourished. When he enforced monotheism, Ak failed to realize that the temples of Egypt were the national, socioeconomic, and cultural hubs. It was the gods, priests that oversaw the industries of agriculture and craftsmanship through their patronage, and they who served as pillars of their communities. So by stripping these temples of authority, he caused Egypt's biggest recession, and an entire empire nearly collapsed because of him. So it's no wonder after his death, Egypt immediately went back to polytheism, and they also abandoned the new city he'd made them build. They destroyed his statues, his effigies, his monuments, and they removed him from their list of kings and history books. In fact, they did this so efficiently that we didn't really even know about him until his remains were found all alone in the city he had forced his subjects to create. Number 10, Tutankhamun. This guy is arguably the most famous Egyptian pharaoh. So what is he doing at the top of the list? Well, King Tut wasn't famous for anything he really did in his lifetime. I mean, he was a young pharaoh, but someone on this list was technically pharaoh since he was two. No, he wasn't famous for anything he really did. Instead, Tutankhamun's tomb, discovered in 1922, was one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. It was almost entirely intact, and his sarcophagus was incredible. Tutankhamun only lived to the age of 20, and how he lost the spark of life is actually still a mystery. He may not have done much other than a lot of religious reforms, but he managed to find another way of living forever. Number 9. Djoser So, with King Tut, he didn't really do much in his short lifetime. With Djoser, we actually don't really know a lot of what he did. Also like Tutankhamun, it was what he did for and after his departure from life that made him famous. Djoser was responsible for the construction of the limestone step pyramid at Saqqara, the first of its kind. It was a huge architectural achievement. A building that stays structurally sound no matter how big it gets? Well, knock me down and call me Susan. The pyramid was actually completed after he lost the will to live by his official Imhotep. Number 8, Amenhotep III. Okay, on to the members of the list who we know did something significant for Egypt during their time on the earth. Amenhotep III ruled an artistically and financially successful Egypt. He had pretty stellar reviews on Google for his trade relations which boosted up the economy of Egypt, but it was his artistic side that got him a bit more of a lasting recognition. He is the pharaoh with the most statues of himself. He created tons of monuments and a lot of stone scarabs that still hold up with tons of stories of historical events. I want some statues myself. Is, is that weird? Probably. Number 7. Hatshepsut Now look, women in Egypt had high status and were respected more than in other parts of the world at the time. But a female pharaoh, while not unheard of, was unfortunately still pretty rare. Hatshepsut here was known as the most successful of those female pharaohs. Her father, King Thutmose I, wanted her to inherit the throne, and to that end, she was brought up learning how to lead. She reigned for 21 years after the death of her husband, and everything she did, from tons of construction projects to creating trade routes, went off without a single hitch. The people of Egypt lived in peace for her entire rule. Number 6. Thutmose III Thutmose III was, surprisingly, the son of Thutmose II, who was the husband of Hatshepsut. You know, number seven, the most successful female pharaoh. So that's the kind of cloth we're working with here. Thutmose was only two when his father bit the dust. So while he was technically the next pharaoh, his stepmother took over with him as co-ruler. This guy's contributions to the Egyptians were tremendous, though. He was literally called the Napoleon of Egypt, which, Shouldn't Napoleon be the Thutmose the Third of France? Either way, Thutmose the Third. He helped expand Egypt like none before. He was a dope warrior, and he helped in the construction of a lot of stuff. Most importantly, the Temple of Karnak. That's how you make Mama proud. Number five, Xerxes the First. You've most likely heard of this guy. If not from his historically inaccurate portrayal in 300, then at least from one or two history classes. But. Adam, wasn't he the emperor of Persia? Yeah, well, guess what, my little bees? Egypt was part of the Persian Empire, which makes him pharaoh as well. This guy gets a pretty bad rap in history. 
But who wrote that history? The Greeks who despised him for his attempted invasion of Greece. Oh, I'm not saying he was great or anything. In fact, he had a bit of a disregard for the traditions of the Egyptians and their way of life. But you cannot tell me that he was not significant in history. Xerxes the Great makes this list for his infamy more than anything else. Number four, Akhenaten. So this is gonna be the second not so beloved pharaoh on this list. But disdain for Akhenaten didn't come from war or the fact that his massive army was defeated by a group of a couple hundred Greeks. No, Akhenaten here was infamous for his devout following of a singular god, Aten, the god of the sun. He actually moved the capital of Egypt to a new location that he titled Akhetaten, or Horizon of Aten. And he kind of made everyone else worship the single god Aten as well. He was famous for a different reason though. Akhenaten was married to Nefertiti. She played a huge part in his religious plans and she is well known in history for the limestone bust that was made of her and has been copied so many freaking times. Number three, Khufu. When you think of Egypt, there is likely one thing that pops straight into your mind. If you say anything other than the Great Pyramids of Giza, you do not pass go, you do not collect $200, and you lose. Khufu is the pharaoh you have to thank for this wonder of the ancient world. We still sorta of don't know exactly how it was constructed, but this Goliath limestone and mud brick structure was the tallest building in the world for like 4,000 years. It was built as the housing for his tomb and as his stairway to heaven. No, not the Led Zeppelin song. It has three chambers inside of it, plus a gallery that we've discovered so far. As for what else Khufu contributed to ancient Egyptian life, we don't have much in the way of texts about that yet. But if this is the main thing, then I mean, I'd take it. Number two, Cleopatra. How could she not be on this list? She was the very last pharaoh Egypt ever had, and she was arguably one of the most famous ones. Not only becoming a figure in history, but a character in literature, theater, and media. Cleopatra VII was pharaoh in Egypt from 51 to 30 BC, and it was one hell of a reign. She introduced tons of reforms to improve the Egyptian economy. She was an awesome diplomat and a scholar. She didn't have things too easy though. Having to fight her own brother for the throne and having to do some diplomacy with various famous Romans. Things kind of fizzled out near the end, but she certainly ended the line of Egyptian pharaohs with a beloved bang, as was her style. Number one, Ramses II. All right, this one was definitely the one I thought of first. Ramses II is arguably the most famous of all the pharaohs. He reigned for 67 years. He had 96 children. He had a crazy successful military campaign conquering the Hittites, Syrians, and Nubians. No other pharaoh that we know of has been able to build like he has. He lived to the age of 90, which is insane for back then. And he professed himself a god, which I'm sure some people actually believed. Even today, when we moved his remains to France for restoration, he had to be given a passport that literally said, King, deceased, under the occupation. Truly an incredibly influential pharaoh. Kicking off the list at number 10, got a passport. Ramses II is known as one of the greatest ancient Egyptian rulers of all time. He was called Ramses the Great, so that's a good sign already. At a young age, he fought in harsh battles to protect the borders of Egypt, and during his reign, the Egyptian army reached 100,000 men. That's a pretty large army. He was later referred to as the Great Ancestor, and it didn't take long for Ramses II to declare himself a god. It's always fun being like, hey, by the way, I'm a god now. That's that's how cool I am. 30 years into his ruling, Ramses was ritually turned into an Egyptian god. It was a formal thing. Though it wasn't until 3,000 years later until Ramses would truly soar through the skies. He was buried in his treasure after 96 years of living, and in 1974, he finally started to show signs of aging. Not too bad. He went from being on display to being sent to Paris to get a glow up, you know, to preserve the king's body even longer. Instead of being listed as luggage on the way to Paris, the pharaoh was given an official Egyptian passport for the commute. The government gave a mummy a passport. This is like the first five minutes of a horror film. Under occupation, it even said king. And there was even a small disclaimer noting that he was in fact still dead. You can never be too sure, you know? Number nine, 
baboon tattoos. Ancient Egyptians worshipped animals. This is common knowledge now at this point. We've heard about their love towards cats, which I'll explain later on, but what about baboons? Yeah, they were pretty important pieces to this ancient puzzle as well. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. Now, one of the most strange things that pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Imagine stealing a pair for your family and then four baboons start doing parkour, chasing you down. That's so alarming. I would just throw it and be like, please stop. You're so scary and strong. They train baboons to pick fruit. They train them to make beer and they also train them to entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to tattoo one on my arm. So you know what? I get it. Get a Harabe tattoo. I'm like, you know, I, it's, I, I see it. I see the similarities. Number eight, worship dung beetles. So worshiping a baboon that dances and makes holiday ales, yeah, I can see how one would worship such a creature. That makes sense. But pharaohs also worship dung beetles and their reasoning may surprise you. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way naturally. Animals are born with natural instincts. Sea turtles race to the sea. These guys follow the cosmos. It's pretty wild. It's one thing to follow the sun naturally because it gives off warmth. Sunflowers will literally turn their head to find the sun, which is super creepy, but it's beautiful. These insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their poop towards it. They'd be like, hello Milky Way, and they just Hieroglyphs of these beetles are seen all over. Like near the sacred lake at the temple of Karnak, for example, there's a massive scarab monument. And today, if you walk around it nine times, you get good luck. And don't worry, you don't have to roll any droppings at the same time. Don't get dizzy, that's all, it's the only rule. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which ancient Egyptians believed was the sun. I grew up thinking the sun was a baby, but that's because I watched Teletubbies, so, you know, depends. Number seven, surprise each other. Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were a pretty beneficial couple, to say the least. Cleopatra would use Caesar's armies, which in turn would allow her to rule Egypt, while Caesar was eyeing down Cleopatra's extreme wealth. They were the perfect pair. She was able to financially support Caesar enough for him to return to power back in Rome, but how did such a perfect pair meet in the first place? Did Cleopatra swipe right? Hmm, no. Well, a then 52-year-old Julius Caesar visited the much younger Cleopatra, so she then sent a surprise gift to his chambers. She got her crew to roll her up in a carpet or bed sheets, it's not really confirmed, something along those lines, and then delivered her to his door completely nude. He unraveled a naked Cleopatra, and he's like, okay, hello. That's pretty impressive. Cleopatra was down for fun surprises. While we don't recommend this as an approach ever, it's one worth mentioning on our list. Number six, gender reveal parties. We've all seen those videos. A guy goes to hit a baseball, he misses it. The baseball breaks and there's pink dust all around his feet and he starts crying. It's wonderful. Gender reveal parties were quite popular, you know, until they started lighting wildfires. But back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. Instead of peeing on a pregnancy test, you would have to use wheat and barley seeds instead. Depending on how those barley crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child. They were right 85% of the time, which is quite impressive back in the day. We went from watering crops to burning them. Hashtag, it's a boy. Number five, space knife. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with the king. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to be buried with your treasure or belongings. It's why ancient Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so grave robbers can't just sneak in after you pass away and then take all of your goodies. So two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other with gold. Now, with iron being more rare than gold during the Bronze Age, this was quite a big deal. With recent advancements in technology, were able to use a technique called portable x-ray fluorescent spectrometry and according to the journal meteorites and planetary science the blade is actually made of iron nickel and cobalt suggesting that its material is that of extraterrestrial origin a blade fell from the sky and now a king has it that's pretty insane also aliens just saying. Number four, KB-55. Also located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KB-55, was found by Edward Arton back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason that we call this tomb by a number rather than a name is because we really don't know for sure who's inside. Even the walls of the tombs inside, they aren't covered with beautiful hieroglyphs to tip us off on their history or their ruling, it's just bare. The only hint as to who is buried remains on the walls. It's one hieroglyph that remains, and it was discovered also in 1907, and it translates simply to, the evil one shall not live again. That's very scary. That's 
Definitely scarier than Greg was here. I don't know. Even massive stones were built and set up in order to prevent anything from getting out. Whereas usually with ancient tombs, it's the opposite. So that's pretty scary. The description for those inside the tomb has also been destroyed. So we have really no idea who's in KB 55 or what. <laughs> Number three, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens and they look athletic. They look to be in great shape, but in reality, these pharaohs were probably quite obese. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day and you have baboons dancing around, plus a little dab of honey every, I don't know, eight minutes, yeah, you're gonna gain some weight. Many of these ancient pharaohs had diabetes. And Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong, but historians all agree that she was out of shape and extremely unhealthy. Honestly, I would do the exact same if I was there back then. She was ahead of her time. If somebody made a statue for me, I'd be like, yeah, give it an eight pack, make him extremely jacked in seven two. Can we do that? Sure, no one's gonna ask questions. I'm Dwayne The Rock Johnston, just, just write it down, please. Number two, worship cats. I am allergic to cats, but I still love them. I still pet them. I ruined my entire night just to get my face right there next to their cute little furry face. But ancient Egyptians, like I said earlier, really loved cats. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. So if there's ever a cat versus dog argument going on on your end of the screen, cats win. I'm allergic and I'm still saying cats win. That's, that's huge. If you had a cat, it means you had good luck. When cats passed away, they too were mummified back in the day. You would think that alone was plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs went a step further. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and then mourn until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. Next time your friend tells you that their cat passed away, tell them that if they really love them, they'll shave their eyebrows off and then see what they say. Also, you don't have to make your friends shave their eyebrows. Let's leave this one in the past. That's fine. Just be sad with eyebrows. Be like, hmm. Number one, fight a hippo. Egypt's first pharaoh, Menes, although we know next to nothing about his history, there is something there that has historians scratching their heads to this day. At his early time, the pharaoh was setting out to unite all of Egypt under his rule. The time that he ruled as well is considered a rather peaceful time when comparing it to years later. We know that he was well respected and we also know that after his 63 years of peaceful ruling, he was stomped to death by a hippo. That's horrible. It's a horrible way to go out. He was an elderly ruler at that time. He was surrounded by guards and somehow a hippo got all the way to his chambers. A hippo! And then ended the pharaoh's life. Some suggest that the reason there's nothing written about this pharaoh's tragic, horrible demise is because it's possible that the hippo was his pet. This is why you don't try and tame a beast as a pet. Perhaps this was an early similar situation as the Siegfried and Roy tiger attack. Just stick to smaller magical cats. They're much safer. They won't stomp you to death. Oh my god, it's horrible. Guys, those were just 10 of the many mysterious things ancient Egyptian pharaohs did, from worshipping Milky Way dung beetles to showing up naked at somebody's front door. Those times were pretty wild. Number 10, overshadowed and the beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals. But when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half-brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video. Stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. 
Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things. Huh. The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen. So there. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if he got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samic III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's, that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? Unless they're a bumblebee, because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day, poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone. The tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays. I get you. The economy was deteriorating. Weather was devastating food production. Things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife, T.A., hated his guts. She, along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chief, 
Chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number 3. Till Death Do Us Part Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife, so when you died you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? Promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins. That's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say, brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey, that's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about, yeah. That thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result, they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title Heretic King and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year, he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. Starting off our list at number 10, the first peace treaty. Unusual at the time? Absolutely. The first peace treaty in history was back in 1271 BC. At this point in history, Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting centuries and come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was finally underway. Tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. What's left to do now at this point? Ramses II and King Hattusili III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if a third party decided to get involved. A copy of the treaty can be found right now in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official. Our man Guinness confirms it. Boom, that's how you know. Moving on. Number nine, game night. I love board games, and honestly, that includes Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then, you know? Pass and go, I'm like, okay, I'll pay the tax. I'm respecting this game so far. But ancient Egyptians, turns out they also loved board games. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen, Senate, and 20 Squares, those are some popular games. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC, and the goal here was to reach the center of the spiral. The board was a coiled snake almost. Senate was the most popular game. Kings and queens alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Of course, the rules are still unknown, heavily debated, just like Monopoly today. I'm like, is it 200 or 100? Are we sure? 
But now we have some ideas how Egyptians played Senate. There were three rows of ten squares, the last five were always decorated. Now it's assumed this game was themed on the afterlife. Plus King Tut was buried with one of these boards, so that's definitely something to do with it. And there's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so you know it was addictive. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. My palms are already so sweaty. Number eight, glamour. Makeup in ancient Egyptian culture was key. Not only did they wear makeup and smell good because they wanted to resemble the very gods they believed in, but makeup had a practical use as well in the daily life of a pharaoh. They believed makeup gave you protection from the gods Ra and Horus. They would put together these beauty kits by grinding down malachite and galena, and then they would create the substance called coal. There wasn't a lot of blending back then. Makeup was often applied directly to the skin using wood or bone. And it wasn't just the ladies as well. Men wore makeup and perfume. Of course, you gotta look good and smell good. Be like, have you seen them? What? I, I wanna wear some of this. They smell like beautifulness. They smell like the afterlife. They smell amazing. Egyptians believed makeup had healing abilities, and honestly, they weren't wrong. Makeup back then had enough lead in them, so eye infections would stay away, ideally. Number seven, Cleopatra's methods. Male rulers took the name Ptolemy and queens were Cleopatra. Her lineage runs deep in the heart of Egypt, but Cleopatra, fun fact, she was not actually Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this new wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted centuries. As Cleopatra got older, she was determined to learn Egyptian, and due to political structure, she started to style herself as the goddess Isis. And then in comes Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had a history of his own, obviously, and his, rather than family and power, was filled more with, you know, lust more than anything. He was known to sleep around and then use their power after doing the dirty. When these two crossed paths, history was never the same. In October of 50 BCE, Cleopatra had fled to Syria. Once there, she established an army and returned two years later to face her brother. Cleopatra knew that during this time, she needed all the support she could get, specifically now from the Romans. At the same time, Caesar was looking to collect debts from Cleopatra's father, so they both relied on each other in some way. It was a match made in heaven. Your most compatible has been updated. Right swipe. I would right swipe on Alexander the Great, for sure. I'd be like, who's this handsome man? Mm. Nicknamed Bald Adulterer. Okay, you know, he's trouble. Number six, King Tut. One of the greatest mysteries is, of course, the history of the young King Tut. The young boy became pharaoh at just age 9 in 1332 BC, but during his time of ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh died at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was seen again. Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful here in history. Sure, it's exciting finding mummies and discovering your history and all that jazz, but when King Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they damaged him. So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age. We have some ideas though, it's not entirely hopeless. It's believed right now that King Tut had a broken leg. After some 3D scans were done, it appears the king wasn't in the best shape prior. He may have fallen off of a chariot. So if Tut passed away at an early age, out of nowhere, this could mean another mystery is afoot. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's resting place. So yes, on one hand, 3D scanning technology is vital when it comes to these ancient sites. We're able to figure out King Tut's medical issues from thousands of years ago. It's impressive, it's great. But thanks to this new technology, we're also finding hidden chambers in these tombs as well. Another theory surrounding the queen, the lost queen, Nefertiti, is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this at all. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. But, but King Tut passed away at age 19, so many believe that his own burial chamber at that point wasn't even built yet. So instead, they had to use hers, they had to improvise. A radar survey conducted around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us a possible hidden chamber, right behind the north wall of the burial chamber. We still haven't found her final resting place, but perhaps this recent 2021 discovery of an ancient city will hold us off until then. Look at this, we missed this on the news. Where was all this? Crazy. Number four, a fake beard. Not really unusual considering the times, but this is definitely worth a mention. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and there were only just a few that were women in total. But during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. 
This was her goal, this was her vision. The pharaoh, fake beard, massive muscles, historians believe this was done as an act of politics. It was done on purpose to make a point. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson then took the throne, Thutmose III. And then he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Number three, no more religion. This was a huge deal in ancient Egypt, rightfully so. The pharaoh Akhenaten thought it would be a great idea to just end multiple religious beliefs. Yep, yeah, just uh, stop. Okay, now we just do the one. Traditional Egyptian culture would believe in multiple gods, but this pharaoh couldn't keep up, so he convinced everybody to believe in just one god, Aten. Well, only days after his passing, the people of Egypt said, screw that, we're gonna go back to multiple beliefs. That was working a lot better for us, thank you, sir. And then also we're destroying every piece of evidence that involves you for trying that nonsense. Yeah, temples, cooking pots, anything with his image, gone and ideally forgotten. It wasn't until the 19th century when we realized this pharaoh once ruled. Number two, hippo problems. Do you have any idea how fast hippos are in real life? I had no clue my entire life. They're really fast, they fly at you, they're like dinosaurs. Hippos can run as fast as 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I'll just lead with that. Pharaoh Menes was Egypt's first pharaoh ever, so it felt fitting to include some pet problems in our list. We don't know much about the lost pharaoh because, well, for starters, he was alive a very long time ago, 3000 BC, that's where we're talking. But what we do know for certain is that King Menes ruled over Egypt during a peaceful time, and he was stomped to death by a hippo. It's literally how his history.com says it, in that order. This king spent over 60 years on the throne, and a hippo got him. I don't think there's a harder way to go out, honestly, in my opinion. It's a mystery still, thousands of years later, but Look at zoos today, I don't know. Maybe a hippo didn't like living like a king. Maybe he wanted to live like Shrek and just splash around and be dirty. He's an animal, he's literally a hippo, you know? And finally coming in at number one, a renewed passport. I'll be honest, right now I currently have no idea where my passport is. Chris, do you know where yours is? Uh, yeah. Wow, we have an adult here. Wow, an adult, that's lovely. I always panic and search for it 13 hours before a flight. I am the worst to travel with. Passports are important, obviously, and they're a pain in the ass. To replace. But did you know you can still get one even if you've been dead for, I don't know, thousands of years? There's a fun fact. Pharaoh Ramses II, one of ancient Egypt's greatest rulers, got a passport back in 1974. Yeah, you heard me. After being exhumed and put on display for so long, it was decided it's time to send the lost king off to Paris to get, you know, a little touched up, being dead that long and all. Now obviously you're not gonna list this pharaoh as luggage, that's so rude. So the Egyptian government gave Ramses II his own official Egyptian passport for his commute. On the passport, he had his age, his occupation, king, obviously, and in case it wasn't clear, it was stated that the king too was deceased. Anyone who's seen the mummy can obviously, you know, relax at that point. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al-Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone, pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number eight, Khufu's ship. When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. 
It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140-foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number 7 Mummy Workshop Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well-preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out until she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about this stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number six, construction manifest. You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm-hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home sense signs your mom hangs up in a kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. Yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, Ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995 it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who, as we know, had over 100 kids. So, the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far, we've only confirmed six, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number three, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship, 
The complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amenhotep III. Amenhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut, the man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chilling in his tomb? Well, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb however was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. Kicking off the list at number 10, Ramses II. Ramses II, part two, you see what I'm doing here. He's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Ramses II is still considered the ruler of rulers. It's not a bad title, not bad at all. In year 30 of his reign, Ramses II was ritually transformed into an Egyptian god. Not bad, I'm turning 30 in a few years. I hope someone turns me into a god or gets me like a bike. <laughs> one of the two, I'll take both. So it was only fair that the spoiled pharaoh erected a bunch of statues of himself. Yeah, big selfies. Ramses put up more selfies than any other pharaoh in history. Most famous of them, the temples of Abu Simbel. There lies a monument dedicated to the late Queen Nefertiti and the Ramseum. We kicked off a part one with Ramses signing the first ever peace treaty, so, so for part two we had to show some of the glamour side of him, you know? Number nine, over 100 children. Who is this guy, Nick Cannon? Ramses II is the father to over 100 children. Uh, with that, of course, came the you know 200 wives, otherwise ow and how, if it was just one person. Ow and how, you know? It's guesstimated that Ramses had 96 sons and 60 daughters. Of all those children, Ramses outlived a lot of them. It's almost like living as a king helped, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, maybe you ate better. Maybe, just a hint, just an idea. Eventually, Ramses was succeeded by his 13th son with his favorite queen, Queen Nefertari, giving her the fanciest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. Nefertari's tomb contains paintings that some consider are the greatest works of ancient Egyptian art. Not bad, I had like baseball wallpaper on mine growing up. Tomb QV66, he spoiled his lady, look at this. We gotta love him. Her tomb is 520 square meters covered in beautiful art, but in 1904 when Nefertari's tomb was rediscovered, all that was found was her mummified knees. Yeah, all that was left was her kneecaps. What, like, who does this? Raiders had stolen all the treasure prior, sometime in the many moons she had been lying there, and they even took her body and left her knees. Like, what? Monsters. They're like, yeah, grab the treasure, leave the patellas, let's do it. Number eight, ready to strike. Pharaohs may have looked beautiful living and after death, but they meant business, okay? They were protective of their land, their family, their many, many lovers and children. The symbol often worn by pharaohs were symbols of power, a Nemes crown. This crown was a striped headcloth and the back of their head was covered with an aureus symbol, AKA an upside down cobra. The cobra symbol represents that the pharaoh is always ready and willing to attack their enemies, attack them with venom. It's a pretty cool symbol. Mine just says DC Etnies shoes. I'm like, I don't, this says fight me, if anything. DC skate shop in my back. I'm like, yeah, you can just attack me, that's cool. Number seven, King Teddy. The Pyramid of Teddy was built for the first ruler of the sixth dynasty. While it's not as flashy or massive as other pyramids, inside it contains the oldest writing 
ever in the religious world, that is. Inside, it contains the pyramid texts, these legendary texts. They go all the way back to 2400 BC. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this king, King Teddy, could ascend to the heavens after his death. This isn't bizarre behavior by any means, but King Teddy, he was specific. He wanted to be a star, like a literal star. There are spells and incantations that are in this tomb meant to free the king's soul as he arrives in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teddy to become a star in the sky and join Osiris and Orion in the hashtag God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to these heavens. It's one thing to be buried with your gold, then you can live another life, but to become a star? I need to expand my dreams, my gosh. King Teddy was onto something here. When I go in my will, I'm gonna be like, can I become a star, is that possible? Can I just throw me up into the heavens? Can I do that? Or bury me, that's cool. Bury me in Ajax, that works. <laughs> Number six, Yozer. For this one, we're looking into some bowl worshiping. So if you're a fan of bowls, here, this one's perfect for you, weirdly enough. Just north of the step pyramid of Pharaoh Dozier, archeologist August Mariette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium, it's a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, and it's a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. This was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls, these bulls that were said to be sacred, of course, and after their death, they would become immortal. Immortal bulls, that sounds badass and also terrifying, that's very scary. Don't wear red around these guys. Tonight at Saqqara, there's a massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's huge, and along the sides, there's 24 chambers, each with a sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Just impossible craftsmanship all around, especially at these times. Like, oh my God, my wrists are tired just typing about this, let alone doing this. Inside these boxes were animal remains, bones and all that jazz, but back in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. You had to mummify them, right? Hence part one and where we are now. How are these tombs built so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and also, where do these bones come from? I have so many questions. Maybe on part three, we'll answer them. Number five, we love cats. I'm allergic to cats, but I still go for it. I still pet them, I risk everything just to, yes, I don't care. I ruined my entire weekend just to get my face all up in their whiskers. Nobody did it like ancient Egyptians. You've probably heard this at one point or another. They worshiped cats. They were like, you know, the legendary <laughs> cats. That was, that was their thing. I'm more of a golden retriever guy, but I get it, they're cute. They respected them, they worshiped them. Even though at the time, dogs were respected for being hunters, cats were still considered magical creatures. It's because they just stare at shit randomly. Mid-conversation, a cat will just be like, no, they're not magical, they're terrifying. They're on something. If you had a cat, you had good luck, apparently. A friend of mine has two fat cats. He has some pretty good luck, I think. If they're fat, they're good, hmm. When a cat passed away back in ancient Egyptian times, they too were mummified. You would think that alone was just plenty of respect, but ancient Egyptians and pharaohs, they would obviously go a step further. Hence this fun list. After their cat died, they would shave their eyebrows off and would mourn them until they grew back. That's like three and a half months of cat depression. That's wild. That's, I, I got over my childhood animal in like six business days. It's not a bad thing, it's just that's a long time, you know? Next time your friend tells you their cat passed away, tell them if they really love them, they would shave their eyebrows. Test them. Number four, ancient Photoshop. When we look back at ancient artwork, we see these kings and queens, well, all the pharaohs were considered kings, but it was equal at the time. And they all look athletic. They all look like these warriors, right? They look to be in great shape. When in reality, a lot of these pharaohs were probably pretty overweight or unhealthy. I mean, think about it. If you slam wine and bread all day, plus a little dab of honey every eight minutes, you're gonna gain some weight. Yeah, that's how it goes. Many of these ancient pharaohs did have diabetes, and Queen Hatshepsut, who was alive during the 15th century BC, her sarcophagus shows her as slim and strong and all that jazz, but almost all historians agree that she was out of shape and quite unhealthy. Honestly, fair, I would do the exact same thing. She was ahead of her time. If somebody was like, hey, I'm gonna make a statue for you, what should I make it look like? I'm like, no, yeah, give him an eight pack, make him jacked, I don't know. Make him look like Michael Jordan, I don't know. Number three, gender reveal parties. Okay, we've seen all these videos online. A guy goes to swing and hit a baseball, he misses, it hits the ground. There's a big pink cloud of smoke, everyone's like, oh my God gender reveal parties, right? They're pretty popular. Turns out they're popular back in ancient Egyptian days, but nobody did it like them. Also, nobody started any wildfires back then when any uh, ancient Egyptians did it, so that's nice. We should go take a note from them. Back in the day, Egyptians had a pretty interesting method for predicting the gender of a newborn. You would have to use wheat and barley seeds. You'd have to pee on them, and then however it grew, that would determine the sex. I would feel bad. First of all, I'd be like, hi, we're curious. Don't mind us. I'm just gonna pee on your crops, sir. Let us know how it grows. We're really aiming towards a boy this time. 
We have 96 girls, so we're gonna try a couple of boys. Yeah, depending on how the crops grew, they could accurately predict the sex of the child, and it worked a lot of the time, it's pretty wild. We went from watering crops to burning them down just to find out a gender. Hashtag it's a boy. Number two, more tattoos. More tattoos for number two. We love it, you guys saw what I did. Ancient Egyptians worshiped animals. We talked about that, the whole cat stuff and the whole hippo situation in part one, that was violent. But what about baboons? Did they get any love? Baboons, I say it weird, baboons, baboons. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Some mummies were found with tattoos of baboons on their bodies. One of the most strange things pharaohs did back in ancient Egyptian days was train baboons to make arrests. Yep, stop resisting, you're going to jail. Me and seven baboons, let's carry them into the car, bam. Imagine stealing food for your family just to like try and get by and four baboons pop out, start doing parkour, and then arrest you in front of everyone. That'd be so embarrassing and also alarming. They trained baboons to pick fruit, make beer, and even entertain. Yeah, these baboons were the life of the party, apparently. Their dance moves alone would be reason enough to get a tattoo on one of my arms, honestly. Going all crazy, throwing their own at people, I'd be like, yeah, right here or here. I don't care. And finally, number one, the afterlife. One of the most fascinating parts about these ancient Egyptian pharaohs is that they would pass away literally covered in gold, head to toe. It's nice to know that this long ago, some of these kings and queens still rest untouched by grave robbers or explorers. The afterlife for these pharaohs was important. And as soon as they take on the throne, work is immediately underway on their tomb. That's a little grim when you think about it. It's like, hey, congratulations. We're gonna start making where you're gonna be buried. It's like. Thanks, I think. These monuments took time, but they were built to last, and clearly, they have. Pharaoh's eyes were painted black with coal. They did this so that they would look like the god Horus after they passed on. 